So as said earlier, so in today's session, we will be seeing about the respiratory system. So the respiratory system is divided into upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. So today we will be seeing about the upper respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract involves the nose and the nasal cavity, the pharynx and the larynx. Okay. So the nose and the nasal cavity, so we will be seeing in detail about this. It comprises of nostrils. So the nostrils is the place where the air goes inside the nose. So the opening which we are able to see just in the beginning of the nose. So that's called as the nostrils. And once the air goes inside, so this place is called as the nasal cavity. Okay, so the nasal cavity, the blue colored chamber is called as the nasal cavity. And this nasal cavity is divided into two parts by means of a septum. Okay, a septum, okay, which is approximately in the middle, divides this nasal cavity into to two chambers, okay, in the right and the left chambers. So nostrils, nasal cavity, and the nasal septum. Now let's see the boundaries. So the nasal cavity, it's just like a chamber, like a room. So it has got a roof, a floor, a wall, a medial wall, and a lateral wall. You know, medial means it's on the middle. Okay, so medial wall is formed by the nasal septum and lateral wall by the lateral nasal cavity. So we will see what are the boundaries of the nasal cavity. The roof is formed by these four bones, okay, from posterior to anterior. So this is the sphenoid bone, the yellow colored one. In front of it, the green colored one is the ethmoid bone. And in front of the ethmoid is the frontal bone and the nasal bone. Okay, so you can see the nasal roof is formed by these four bones, phenoid, ethmoid, frontal, and nasal bones. The floor of the nasal cavity, okay, the floor of the nasal cavity is this one, okay, the one which separates the nasal cavity and the oral cavity, okay. It's formed by this bone. So let's see like what are the bones which are present in the floor. So it is formed by the maxilla bone, which is in purple shown here. Okay, so the maxilla bone and here the palatine bone. Okay, there you can see that horizontal plate of palatine. So this is the palatine bone. So these two bones form the floor of the nasal cavity. The next one, the nasal septum. Okay, the nasal septum, that is the one which is present approximately in the middle. Okay, which is present approximately in the middle and dividing the nasal cavity into two parts. The upper part, it is formed by the ethmoid bone. So here you can see the ethmoid bone. Okay, the posterior part, it is formed by another bone which is called as warmer bone. Okay, the verma bone and the anterior part is formed by a cartilage, not a bone. So that's why if you just move your nose, you will be able to move it sideways because the anterior part of the nose is formed by this cartilage, which is called a septal cartilage. So two bones which are on the posterior aspect, okay, one on the upper part, one on the lower part. The upper part is the ethmoid. And the lower part is the verma bone. The anterior part is formed by the septal cartilage. Okay. And nasal cavity, nasal septum, actually is hardly in the middle. Okay. So that's why I use the term approximately. Okay. So it is approximately in the middle. Now coming to the boundaries. The lateral wall, okay, so we have seen the roof, we have seen the floor, we have seen the nasal septum, now the lateral wall, okay, the lateral wall of the nasal cavity, you can see three projections here, 
okay two green projections and one white color projection okay so this projections are called as concave okay concave okay so one is on the upper part which is called as superior conca middle conca and inferior conca conca is singular and concave is plural okay so there are three conca on either sides three pairs of conca totally six so superior conca middle conca inferior conca now if you see below this projection here there is a cavity okay here there is a small space this small so below the superior conca there is a space below the middle conca there is a space below the inferior conca there is a space this space is called as meatus okay so this is superior meatus middle meatus and inferior meatus okay so below the superior conca is the superior meatus middle conca middle meatus inferior conca inferior meatus okay any doubts until now all right now we will go to the next one okay so we have seen the boundaries we have seen the roof floor the nasal septum and the lateral wall of the nasal cavity okay so this is yet another picture which shows the conca so here you can see the superior conca and the middle conca okay and this is the inferior conca okay the inferior conca is a separate bone okay if you would have seen in the uh, two weeks back i took a lecture on the skeletal system the name of the bones in the skull okay so in that there was the inferior conca okay so one of the bone is the inferior conca okay so this is the inferior conca it's a separate bone whereas superior and middle conca are part of the ethmoid bone okay they are part of the ethmoid bone okay so superior conca below it is the superior meatus middle conca below it will be the inferior middle meatus inferior conca below it will be the inferior meatus now the lining epithelium okay the lining epithelium what is lining lining the respiratory passage near the nostrils okay near the nostrils it is green colored right so here there is only skin all right so this is lined by skin is lined by stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium okay so non keratinized or partially keratinized epithelium okay on the outer part by keratinized and as you go inside it will be non keratinized so you can say it is partially keratinized so the nostrils the nasal vestibules these are lined by stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium okay then as the air goes inside the respiratory passage most of the nasal cavity is lined by the respiratory epithelium what is this respiratory epithelium it is pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium okay pseudo stratified what is the meaning of pseudo stratified it appears to be like a stratified but it is not a stratified okay in the epithelium lecture i had told you about this okay so pseudo stratified ciliated because there are small hair like structures on the top of the epithelium so those are called as cilia okay ciliated columnar epithelium so pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium lining the nasal cavities on the roof okay on the roof there is olfactory regions olfactory means the primary special sense for the nose you know it is smell right so the smell receptors are located in the nasal roof okay you can see that it is present the pink colored portion okay which involves the nasal roof 
the superior concha and a part of the superior meatus as well. So all these regions are lined by olfactory epithelium. Olfactory means smell. Okay. So whenever we take breathing, the smell we are able to recognize because of this olfactory regions, which contains special cells which recognize special epithelium which will be able to grasp the smell. Suppose in the case of a, a, a fracture, fracture involving the nasal roof, example a boxer, okay, a boxer, okay, so during the punch when the face has been, uh, face has been fractured and the nasal roof is damaged, so what will happen? Because the nasal roof is damaged, the epithelium might be damaged and this person might have a loss of sensation. Okay, loss of smell sensation. So he will not be able to smell. Okay, so the nasal roof is very important as it lodges the olfactory epithelium. Okay, so this is how it looks. The respiratory epithelium, you can see that this is pseudo stratified. Okay, it is appearing to be like a stratified, like a multiple layer, but all the layers are attached to a single basement membrane. So that's why this is called as pseudo stratified. There is cilia on the top, ciliated and column shape, columnar epithelium. Okay, pseudo stratified, ciliated, columnar epithelium. Okay, and this is the olfactory epithelium, which is present in the nasal roof. You can see there are cells, columnar cells, and in between them, there are flask-shaped cells. Okay, so these flask-shaped cells, which are present in the nasal roof, you can see they are having a large, a long uh, ciliary processes. Okay, so these are the ones which will grasp the smell, okay, and will stimulate this cell, and the stimulated thing will be going along the nerve endings towards the brain. Okay, and the brain recognizes what type of smell it is. Okay, so respiratory epithelium and olfactory epithelium. Olfactory epithelium located in the nasal root. Now the next one is paranasal sinus. Okay, what are the paranasal sinus? They are, sinus means small cavities. Okay, and these cavities are located parallel to the nasal cavity okay they are located you know the nasal cavity just parallel to the nasal cavity there are certain cavities in the skull and these are called as paranasal sinus there are four paranasal sinuses four pairs of nasal paranasal sinus okay maxillary air sinus which is the biggest one and present in the cheeks okay in the cheeks okay the maxillary air sinus okay frontal air sinus which is present inside the frontal bone okay frontal air sinus ethmoid air sinus the green colored portion ethmoid air sinus okay and lastly sphenoid air sinus okay all these are located within the respective bones. Maxillary air sinus is located within the maxillary bone, frontal air sinus within the frontal bone, ethmoid air sinus within the ethmoid bone, and sphenoid air sinus within the sphenoid bone. Okay, so there are four pairs of cavities maxillary air sinus, frontal air sinus, uh, ethmoidal air sinus, and sphenoidal air sinus. Now, if you see the ethmoidal air sinus, it is like a tunnel, right? So we are dividing the air sinus, the ethmoid air sinus, into three parts: anterior ethmoidal, middle ethmoid air sinus, and posterior ethmoid air sinus. Okay. So since the ethmoid sinus is quite long, it's divided into three parts: anterior ethmoid air sinus, middle ethmoid air sinus and posterior ethmoid air sinus okay on either sides okay so from maxillary sinus frontal air sinus 
anterior ethmoid, middle ethmoid, posterior ethmoid, and then sphenoid sinus. Now, why the sinuses are present? Okay, the sinuses, they are the place where the mucus is formed. Okay, mucus. Okay, the nasal mucus. Okay, the nasal mucus does not form only when there is infection. Even normally, the mucus is secreted. Why there should be nasal mucus, the mucus inside the nasal cavity? Okay, so if, if you think like why, why there should be a mucus formation inside the nasal cavity, it has to filter the air. Okay, when we breathe in, we might breathe in certain dust, small particles. Okay, so if it is a mucus, it will, the, the dirt and the dust, they will get stuck into the mucus. Okay, and prevent it from entering into the lungs. Okay, so the mucus formation, okay, it helps as a voice resonator. Okay, like what is the meaning of voice resonator? So whenever we speak, it amplifies the voice. If you see a speaker, inside a speaker, it will be empty. Why it is empty? To increase the sound. Okay, so this is acting like a voice resonator, a natural made voice resonator. The next one is, it reduces the skull weight. Okay, if you see the skull bone, the skull is formed by large number of bones. But what is the connection between the skull and the thorax? Only the cervical vertebra. Okay, the cervical vertebra which is located on the back. Okay, so the skull should be weighing less and there is a large number of structures which are present in the skull. Brain, okay, eye, tongue. Okay, so there are a lot of other structures which are present in the skull, inside the skull. So in order to reduce the weight, there is this cavity, the paranasal air sinuses. And lastly, insulation. Okay, what is the meaning of insulation? Suppose if you walk on a very hot climate, okay, what happens when you go outside initially, the, the hot air should, if it goes inside our nasal cavity and then into the pharynx and then into the lungs, it will damage the epithelium. Okay, so what happens, it lack, acts like a conditioner. Okay, it conditions the air, like an air condition. Okay, because of the mucus, and the hair which is located inside the nasal cavity. So they will, they will filter the dirt, okay, and the fresh air enters inside the nasal cavity, pharynx, okay, and then the lungs, okay. And the otherwise happens during the cold weather. Suppose if you are walking in a very cold weather, Okay, the cold air also damages the epithelium. So what happens when the cold air goes inside the nasal cavity, the cold air is changed into a little bit warmer temperature so that it doesn't go and damage the epithelium inside. Okay, so these are the functions of the nasal cavity. Okay, the, sorry, the paranasal air sinuses. Okay, paranasal air sinuses, frontal, maxillary, ethmoid and sphenoid. Any doubts? Oh, good. Right. No, now, no. not all right. Now, what we are going to see is we have seen this paranasal sinus, right? The mucus is produced inside this paranasal sinus. But how come this mucus enters into the nasal cavity? Okay, so how does it enter? It is produced in this cavity, but how can it enter inside the nasal cavity? Okay, so for that, we are going to see the meatus. Okay, the meatus. So I already told you what is the meatus, right? Below the concha, there is meatus. Below the superior concha, there is superior meatus. Below the middle concha, there is middle meatus. Below the inferior concha, there is inferior meatus. Okay, now if you see all the air sinuses, all the air sinuses, that is 
frontal as sinus, maxillary as sinus, anterior and middle ethmoid sinus will be draining into the middle meatus. So here you can see in this picture, the concha is cut. Okay, the concha is cut. Okay, so you can see the superior meatus, the middle concha is cut. So you can see the middle meatus, the, the inferior concha is cut and you can see the inferior meatus. So what opens into the middle meatus? All paranasal air sinus except posterior ethmoid and sphenoid air sinus opens into the middle meatus. That is the frontal air sinus, maxillary air sinus, the anterior ethmoid and the posterior, sorry, the middle ethmoid air sinus, they open into the middle meatus. Frontal, maxillary, anterior and middle ethmoidal air sinuses. Now, where does this posterior ethmoidal air sinus open? The posterior ethmoid air sinus opens into the superior meatus. Okay, it opens into the superior meatus. Where is superior meatus located? Below the superior concha. Okay, and what about the sphenoid air sinus? This is the sphenoid air sinus. The sphenoid air sinus opens above the superior concha. Okay, it opens above the superior concha. Okay, and this recess is also called as sphenoethmoidal recess because it is present between the sphenoid bone and the ethmoid bone. So that's why this is also called as sphenoethmoidal recess. Okay, sphenoethmoidal recess. All right, so once again, this slide is very, very important. So there will be questions based on this. They'll be asking you like which paranasal sinuses opens into which meatus. Okay, so maxillary air sinus, frontal air sinus, anterior and middle ethmoid opens into the middle meatus. Okay, below the superior concha, that is the superior meatus, posterior ethmoidal air sinus open. And above the superior concha, the sphenoid, through the sphenoethmoidal air sinus, the sphenoid air sinus opens. All right. Now, lastly, the inferior meatus. What opens in the inferior meatus? There is no paranasal air sinus in the inferior meatus. So what is opening here? So here there is an opening for a structure which is called as nasolacrimal duct. Naso lacrimal duct. This is not a paranasal air sinus. Okay, so what is this naso lacrimal duct? Okay, I will take you to the previous slide. Here you can see the naso lacrimal duct. Lacrimal means tear. Okay, naso, you know, nose. Duct is a tube. Okay, what happens? The tear is secreted in the eye. Okay. It is not only when we cry the tear is secreted. The tears are secreted continuously. When we cry, the amount of tears is more. But even when we don't cry, even right now, the tears are being secreted by our eyes. Okay? It will be secreted by our eyes continuously. And each time we blink, okay, when we blink our eyes, the blink means we close and open our eyes. Okay, each time when we clean, close our eyes, okay, the uh, eye is washed by this tear because it's like a wiper. Okay, in the wiper in a car, okay, so it keeps the window of the car, uh, window of the car clean, right? So similarly, each time we blink, the tears, they wipe the anterior part of the eye to make the vision clear, okay? And what happens to this tear after it blinks? It goes through these two small tubes. Okay, you can see through these small tubes. And then it enters into the nasolacrimal duct. And this nasolacrimal duct opens into the inferior meatus, just like a drainage. Okay, the tears which come from the eyes they drain through this nasolacrimal duct and then opens into the inferior 
MA address. Okay. So now you could have observed. Okay. So you could have observed whenever you are having cold. Okay. Like stuffy nose. Okay. So whenever you are having cold or stuffy nose, sometimes water comes automatically from your eyes. Even though you are not emotional or crying. Okay. You can see that water comes out through your eyes continuously if you are having a blocked nose. Okay. Now why is that? That's because the blocked nose, it blocks the nasolacrimal duct. The mucus is blocking the nasolacrimal duct in the inferior meatus. Okay. So because of this blocked mucus, the tear secretion from the eye is unable to get into the inferior meatus. Okay. It is unable to enter into the inferior meatus. So that's why we feel like, like the person, like a person with a blocked nose, the uh, tears would be coming automatically from the eyes. Okay. Do you have any doubts here? No. Okay. All right. Now I have a doubt. I will ask you a question. Okay. So now, um, I told you the tears are secreting through this nasolacrimal duct, right? And then it enters into the inferior meatus. So normally the tears should come through our nose continuously, right? But we are not, there are no watering secretion from our nose continuously. So what happens to this tear? I am telling normal persons the tears comes through this nasolacrimal duct into the inferior meatus. Okay, so there should be constant leakage of this tears through our nose. Okay, but it's not happening. Why? Any idea? All right, I'll tell you. Yes. Because the amount of secretion of the tears is very minimal. Okay, the amount of secretion of tears is actually very minimal and when it enters into the inferior meatus, inferior meatus, okay, it automatically drains through the posterior part, okay, it goes towards the posterior part of the nasal cavity and when it reaches the posterior part, we tend to swallow it, okay, the tears, the minimal, okay, the only very minimal is being secreted which will be sticking into the nasal cavity, okay? And then if it is more, if there is more tear secretions, it will be going along the posterior part of the nasal cavity, okay? And where the person swallows, okay? Now you see how important is the nose. So it has got not only the nasal cavity, nasal septum smell, there is also paranasal air sinus, and there are also small tubes which control the secretion of the eye. Okay. All right. So this is with regard to the nose. Any doubts? All right. Now we will go no. to the we will go to the next part of the upper respiratory tract, which is the pharynx. The pharynx. It is starting from the base of the skull to C6. C6 vertebra means cervical, sixth cervical vertebra. And is divided into nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. It's lined by stratified squamous mostly. Okay. And the nerve supply is by vagus. Okay. Let, let's see, like, where is it present? We will see each one of these pharynx is now. Nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx separately. All right. So the nasopharynx, it starts with the posterior part of the nasal cavity and ends in soft palate. And these are the structures which you need to know. Okay. I will show you in the picture. So this is the, cro the cross section of the head. So here you can see the nasal cavity, the three concha superior middle and inferior concha, below it will be the meatus. This part, the pink colored portion is the nasopharynx, which is starting from the posterior part of the nasal cavity 
and ending in the soft palate. Okay, ending in the soft palate. So this one is the nasopharynx. You can see the entire pharynx is beginning at from the base of the skull and ending in the sixth cervical vertebra. And the pharynx is divided into nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Okay, the three pharynx. Naso, oro, and laryngopharynx. Now the two, two structures which I want to make you know regarding the uh, nasopharynx. It is the auditory tube and the pharyngeal tonsil or adenoids okay now where is this in the nasopharynx here you can see a small tube okay a small depression this is the tube which is called as the pharyngotympanic tube or audit auditory tube it's also called as the auditory tube why it is called auditory tube what is the meaning of audio audio is ear okay how is this tube? Why is this tube named auditory tube? Because this tube, one end is located in the pharynx, the other end of the tube is present in the ear. Okay, it is present in the ear. Okay, now what is the function of this auditory tube? You must have experienced while going on the flight. What happens when the flight suddenly takes off? When the flight takes off suddenly, you will feel fullness in the ear. And what do you do? You take a little bit of water or swallow or have some chocolate or something. Okay, so what happens during the process? When you swallow or drink, this auditory tube opens. Normally when we are on the ground, okay, the air pressure, okay, the air pressure which is inside the ear, and the outside, okay, the outside atmospheric air is the same. But when we go up suddenly, what happens? The air pressure outside drops, okay, the outside air temperature, the air pressure comes down, okay. And what happens to the pressure inside the ear? The middle ear is actually a closed cavity. Okay, the middle ear is a closed cavity, so the pressure inside the middle ear builds up, and that's why we feel there is fullness in the ear. Okay, and whenever we swallow, okay, or drink some fluid, this auditory tube opens up and maintains equal pressure between the middle ear and the pharynx. Okay, so this is the function of the auditory tube i will repeat this once again in your uh, when the in the year class okay which we will be seeing as the it will be most probably towards the last of the semester okay so the auditory tube it connects to the middle ear and maintains equal pressure the next one is pharyngeal tonsil so here you can see okay on the roof of the nasopharynx that is is a tonsil which is called as pharyngeal tonsil okay so this pharyngeal tonsil is also called adenoid okay adenoid okay why there is this pharyngeal tonsil tonsil is composed of lymphoid structures lymph okay basically lymphoid they contain a large number of lymphocytes you know that the lymphocytes are the structures which help in defense fighting against the microorganisms okay they help to fight against the microorganisms all right so what happens when when we breathe air sometimes the germs enter okay when the germs enter this adenoids they will capture the germs and they will destroy them okay so that's why the pharyngeal tonsil is present okay this is also called as adenoids, adenoids or pharyngeal tonsil. So auditory tube and adenoids are located in the nasopharynx. The next one is the oropharynx. It is extending from the soft palate to the epiglottis or C3 vertebra 
and you need to note only one structure here which is palatine tonsil i'll show you this in this picture itself you know that this is the oral oropharynx okay starting from the soft palate this is the soft palate this is hard palate this is soft palate okay hard palate because it has got bone inside and this is the soft palate okay now in the soft palate here you can see palatine tonsil okay remember this is called as pharyngeal tonsil this is palatine tonsil pharyngeal tonsil is located in nasopharynx palatine tonsil is located in oropharynx okay now why there is a tonsil here same for a same because when we eat there could be some germs okay and all these germs are captured by the palatine tonsil okay palatine tonsil okay so here you can see the ignore this picture okay i just wanted to show you the soft palate here okay i wanted to show you the soft palate and the palatine tonsil none of the other things are needed for you these are for mbbs students okay and here also you can see the palatine tonsil okay which is located in the posterior part of the tongue okay just where the posterior part of the tongue is present okay the palatine tonsils are located here lastly the laryngopharynx the laryngopharynx begins at c3 vertebrae and ends at the lower border of cricoid cartilage which is c6 cervical vertebrae we will see about the laryngopharynx okay the laryngopharynx that is which is also called as the larynx okay the larynx it's also called as a voice box it's the one which produces the voice okay and the laryngopharynx extends from the root of the tongue until the trachea okay and in males you can see a prominence okay in the anterior part of the neck which is called as adam's apple i will show you all the pictures okay the larynx is mainly formed of cartilages three pad and three unpad cartilages the unpad cartilages are epiglottis thyroid cricoid and the pad cartilages are arytenoid corniculate and cuneiform okay let's see the thyroid cartilage this is the largest laryngeal cartilage so this is the thyroid cartilage okay so this is how the thyroid cartilage looks and the next one the cricoid cartilage it is looking like a ring shape okay the cricoid cartilage okay the arytenoid cartilage is located on the top of the cricoid cartilage okay and above it is corniculate cartilage above the arytenoid cartilage is the corniculate cartilage and the other one will be the cuneiform cartilage okay so here you can see the epiglottis cartilage epiglottis is a very important structure preventing the food from entering into the respiratory passage so whenever the person swallows the food okay so the epiglottis closes the larynx and the foot is directed into the esophagus okay so epiglottis is an important structure preventing the foot from entering into the respiratory passage so that's why people say you should not talk when you eat right so what happens when we talk okay so the foot the voice is produced from the respiratory tract okay the voice is produced from the respiratory tract okay and the, the because of the voice is produced and when we eat there will be incoherence and sometimes the food might enter into the respiratory passage all right so this is regarding the epiglottis okay now yeah lastly i think there are two more slides i'll finish that off okay now inside the larynx i said voice is produced how is the voice produced the voice is produced 
through this important fold which is called as vocal fold okay when we look inside the larynx it appears like this okay it appears like this so this one is the vocal fold and above this there is another fold which is called as ventricular fold okay vocal fold and ventricular fold the space between the two vocal fold is called as rima glottis okay the space between the two vocal fold it's called as rima glottis okay now how is the voice produced so whenever you speak if you notice down what we do before we speak we take a little bit of air inside okay we in we take a little bit of air inside and this rima glottis which is bounded by this vocal fold they close okay they close and then they open little by little as we speak okay so as we speak the air is let out okay little by little okay and there is vibration of this vocal fold okay and this vocal fold vibration is amplified in the head and you know the tongue okay the tongue is very important for pronunciation okay so the voice is coming from here okay and the tongue is the one which makes it meaningful okay so the vocal fold the next one is the ventricular fold between the two vocal fold is the rima glottis okay so here you can see this is the picture which is taken from ackland okay so here you can see this is the vocal cord okay so this vocal cord they will adjust as we speak okay they will adjust and they will let little amount of air to go out as we speak okay the larynx is also lined by pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium except for epiglottis and vocal cord okay except for epiglottis and vocal cord which is lined by stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium all right <clears throat> this is the real picture of a person who says ah uh, okay whenever a person says ah uh, what happens to his vocal fold so here you can see this is the epiglottis this is the epiglottis this is the arytenoid cartilage and this is the corniculate cartilage the cuneiform is tiny above it okay arytenoid and corniculate cartilage now this is inside the larynx when you look inside the larynx you can see a white colored structure this white colored structure is the vocal fold and above it there is a pink colored structure which is called as vestibular fold the space between the vocal fold is called as rima glottis okay the space between the two vocal folds it's called as rima glottis okay <clears throat> lastly between the vocal fold and the vestibular fold there is a space and this space is called as laryngeal sinus or sinus of larynx okay sinus of larynx so the functions of larynx it's mainly for producing voice cough okay cough like whenever what happens when uh, some dust or something enters into our lungs okay what we do <coughs> we cough right so what happens when we cough so that this vocal cords they will the vocal cords they will close completely okay and the chest will compress and suddenly this vocal cords will open okay and because of the pressure the dust which entered into the lungs they will be sent out so that's a protective mechanism cough 
okay and lastly sphincter sphincter is preventing the food from entering into the respiratory passage so these are the functions of the larynx now here if you could see this is epiglottis arytenoid cartilage corniculate cartilage and this is the vocal cord now what happens here the vocal cord is completely closed okay so this person is breathing inside and he is holding the holding the air inside the lungs okay and suppose if this vocal cord opens up suddenly if this vocal cord opens up suddenly that's called as cough okay when this vocal cord opens up suddenly during this expiration so he is holding this air inside the uh, inside the lungs and suddenly he will let out okay so this is just a protective mechanism for cough okay so initially it is closed okay the uh, thorax it will contract increase the pressure inside the lungs and suddenly the vocal cord will open releasing through that because of that pressure whatever germs has entered into the lungs will be sent out so cough is actually good okay and it helps in removing the foreign particles as well as the microbes all right now these three things we will see it in tomorrow's class laryngeal paralysis endotracheal intubation is the one which is uh, done during anesthesia and the cricothyroidotomy is an opening which is done in the trachea in case if there is any obstruction i will discuss about these three things in tomorrow's class separately okay any doubts no doctor okay i know that 